Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our webinar on talent identification. This is part two of a three-part series um, delivered by Ian Mork, who's our Director of Scouting at NorCal um, and, and one of our, our, our head um, PDP coaches. I think you all know Ian has a fantastic background um, and is, is, is well regarded across the country. Um, so um, he has some great, some great wisdom, some, some advice. Um, and for me, as someone who works in the uh, the club game is great to see. Um, it's, it's great to get some insight into how to identify players. We all do it during our evaluations, during our tryouts, and and based on last week's, I'm excited to get started and build in upon um, his presentation last week. So, uh, again, housekeeping things. Uh, this has been recorded. It will be made available to everyone. Uh, you'll be sent a link tomorrow, um, and everything will be on the front of our website under the um, coach education webinars. So, without further ado, Ian Mark. Thank you so much, David. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining again. I know you've probably had your fair share of screen time this week. Uh, so maybe after this, you can um, set the computer and screens aside and, and go get some fresh air, hopefully. Um, hope all of you are safe and healthy with your families and at home. Um, Want to get right into it. I have quite a bit of uh, information to cover here. Um, this is obviously the part two, so the planning piece. Um, if you were able to see the part one, we just we went over um, kind of the summary of all of this. And now we want to get into some of the suggestions um, for you to identify talent in the competitive club environment. Hopefully this will be for you to have a practical application of it for those clubs that are, are on the competitive side training three days a week and mainly we're focused on the U12 to U19 age groups. This, uh, these are the main aims with, again, uh, always keeping in mind with the game, our, our foundations of soccer with the game in the middle. Um, we're obviously really focused on the player and the coach, um, but you're gonna see how important it is um, that the club's vision, especially their core values, their style of play, and their game model, how that ties in, which you've, uh, you've gotten some of that information from Benjamin, so you'll see quite a bit of crossover there too. So today we mainly want to review the definition. Again, that'll be really quick. The specific areas of planning, we'll go through a little bit of the preparation and what event you're scouting at or for. Uh, the process, some of the observational tools, um, and then some really important considerations, and then we'll try to summarize it. So again, just want to remind you of this. This is kind of our starting point for this. Um, could be def you could have your own definition, that's fine, but just this ability to recognize and predict potential, and that's really what we're trying to do. Um, because, uh, I mean, there are obviously a lot of people I know on this call that have a ton of experience, even playing it at, at uh, the highest levels in the game and um, and we all might be standing together and watch a game and, and we all might have our own opinion on which player is going to make it and somebody's not going to be correct somebody will be um, it's really predicting uh, and, and what you think the potential will be but right now it's also just uh, trying to apply this to your environment so on their current abilities and then we'll, we'll touch more on these um, important considerations at the bottom. The special trait, the biological age, chronological, you can see relative age effect in the environment. <clears throat> You'll hear that a lot. So just a reminder, this was in the first one as well. Um, just to let all of you know that we want to try to translate this the best we can to your environment. So we're really focused on the recreational uh, going up to the competitive or um, some of the, the competitive teams that are, are less committed and maybe those players want to try to reach a higher level in the competitive environment. Um, obviously, uh, with some of the changes going on, there might be even more of a link between the competitive and even the professional. Um, so uh, we just wanted to keep in mind what we're really, um, what we're focused on and what we're trying to share here, which, which level. So these are the key moments that we mentioned before. So we'll get, we'll dive deeper into the planning, the evaluating, selecting will be in the final part, uh, part three. <clears throat> Another slide, 
uh, just so you know, just to remind the planning piece here, preparation, the event, and the process and observational tools. So now if we dive into this a little bit more, talking about researching the player, we'll go into the game, observing the game or a trial and also a tryout. And I wanted to mention also that, you know, playing street soccer, I think that's a pretty unique, um, probably a unique uh, situation or example. Um, we were in Fairfield one time um, for a PDP session and there was a player that we all recognize training. He's just playing on his own. He's playing with a few other kids, but uh, he couldn't take his eyes off of our training. Um, and we finally went and talked to him and, and, uh, and asked him what he was up to. And he just said, oh, he loves the game and he just plays. He's not with the club. We let him play a little bit towards the end of the training and try to get him in the game. And then basically we promoted him to a local club. I, want, I feel like it was Solano. And uh, we promoted him to that club. Um, and we had just seen him playing there in the streets. So I think it's kind of unique, but I, I think it's something to consider, um, you know, if you do happen to see a player um, playing street stalker. But that's about the extent we'll go into that. Uh, researching the player, that's included in all of these. So just keep that in mind. So any pre-information that you can gain, this is before you're stepping on the field to evaluate a player. These are some of the points that we came up with and there, there could be more, of course. So did you discuss with another coach or staff member, one of your, you know, maybe one of your coaches saw a player and said, hey, you should really take a look at this kid that I saw in this recreational game. Um, um, or maybe one of your staff members also kind of tipped you onto it. A tip by a person in the community you, you trust. Um, for me personally, I, I use that quite a bit. Um, you know, there are some, some dads out there, some moms out there that play at the highest level. Uh, they understand, you know, they, they can identify talent already. Um, and if someone, you know, happens to tip you about a, a player, um, that, that could also be where you already have a little bit of information that, um, you know, how they did in the game or, or where they saw them. So um, maybe you already have a little bit of information. <clears throat> Any stats on the player? I was thinking more potentially high school or if there's ways that you could gain stats on players. Uh, maybe you saw them on a video. I don't know how common that is, but um, could be. And then I think this personal and club environment you'll see that came up on our definition uh, and that'll come up throughout this entire presentation all the way through. It's something to always keep in mind. Um, you know, where do they live obviously in relation to, to where your club is, their clubs and their club history. Um, were they a captain at their last club or the recreational club? Maybe um, were they, um, have they been to four clubs already this season? <laughs> that might be something to consider. Um, how are they in school? Maybe you already know this. Uh, do you know something about their parents? Are they, are they from a, a, a single parent um, family or, or do they have a huge family? And those kind of things. Um, there's a pre-questionnaire, um, Andrew Zemer, Kevin Thorson, they both helped me a lot to just kind of look this over and talking to Andrew. He, he made a great point um, about what they had done at Ballistic. At one point when a player um, mentioned, and sorry, Andrew, I didn't ask you if I could tell him this, but here we go. Uh, so if a player uh, had signed up and wanted to come to the tryout, um, then they sent them back kind of a pre-questionnaire and tried to get just some of the personal info on them. So I, I thought that was a, a great example. So those are just some ideas. Now we have to consider if you're maybe watching them just at a game. So are you watching just a specific player or are you looking at a, a few different players or are you just there and just to see who catches your eye? What's the level of the game? I think that's very important. Okay, it could be a high school game. It might be a community league. Um, you know, there are a lot of leagues. I, I think someone at one point told me in Stockton alone, there are three different unaffiliated youth leagues. You know, I, I don't know if that's true, but uh, you know, some clubs go there and, and, and look for talent. I think it's really smart, actually. Maybe it's recreational league. Maybe it's a playoff game. You know, so the level of the game um, 
that that should hold a lot of weight in in your evaluation as well. Uh, pressure and intensity, I think that's a big one. Um, you know, if if the other team is at a much lower level and you're watching a player and and um, it doesn't look like there's there's a lot of uh, it's not com competitive for them, then I think it's something you need to consider as well. And then the pressure. I think that could go both ways. The pressure also of, let's say, a playoff game and how a player reacts in, in those moments could say a lot about their personality as well. Uh, the rosters, names, date of birth, maybe you already have some of that information. Pre-information, maybe you already, uh, you know, you're at a game, are they playing out of position or are they playing in their position? Uh, those are all things to consider. Observing at a trial. So this would maybe be a guest player is at a training session. Um, I think this happens quite a bit. Um, can you coach and evaluate at the same time? It's just something for you to think about. Some can, no problem. Or maybe you have an assistant coach that could, could lead part of the training and you can step back. Maybe you can take notes. Uh, I mean, this is all up to you to decide, just things to consider. Um, you can see if the player's coachable. Can they play in other positions? Is it a one-day trial, multiple days? Can you observe them in a practice game? Um, maybe against another team that's inside of your club, you set up a game, so then you can, you can see them more in, a, in the game environment inside of the training. Um, and then any pre-information. So maybe, the, maybe you already know a lot about them because they're from your own club and they're playing up, and, and, or maybe it's from an outside club or unaffiliated. And then observing at a tryout, and we'll, we'll go pretty deep into this because I, I personally wanted to include this. I, I think it applies to, to most people here. I think there are a lot of clubs that still have tryouts. We know there are some clubs that don't have tryouts. Um, I, I, I think uh, that's also a really good idea if you, if you can just maintain the, the consistency with your membership and, and uh, you have a way of of inviting players and, and building and forming teams. I'm okay either way, but uh, as far as tryouts go, um, you know, you, things to consider again, the number of days and hours, obviously. Um, what, it, what is your available staff and their responsibilities? And I put there six eyes in Bayer Leverkusen that, um, you know, and this is talking about the highest level, but I, I thought it was a good example to share with you is that, um, in order for them to, even, even in, with their youth players, in order for them to, to sign a player into, they had to have, I believe it was the technical director, the head coach, and the director of scouting uh, that all had to see the player in order for them to make an agreement, um, which uh, there's something, there's, there's a lot of worth in that. Uh, I realize that a lot of you, um, you might be the things that I'm going over, even in this in this uh, presentation, uh, you might have to cover everything. I, I, I get that too. So that's why I just want to share some different options. Uh, anticipated number of players. What are the fields and the conditions, obviously? Field or fields, um, the weather, is it turf, is it on grass, futsal, indoor, all of these things to consider when you're evaluating. The training plan and games. This is a really important piece. So um, how, you, how you've organized um, the entire session, the rotation, is it this, are you doing circuits, the game forms, what are they? Um, regulation size goals, small goals, how much equipment do you really have? Um, I mean, in Belize, to be honest, with some of the youth national teams, if we had a bag of balls, and then I brought a few nets down uh, one of my trips, then um, that's what we had and that's what, and we made it happen. So, um, but it's just to consider um, what that could look like for you to, to help organize everything. The teams and the positions, right, can you organize it beforehand? Are you already familiar? You might have a lot of players obviously that you're, you're very familiar with already that are coming, coming back to try out. Um, so maybe you could divide so that they're playing against each other to try to, to keep it very competitive. And positions, of course. How are you going to organize that at the very beginning of the tryout? Um, are you going to bring them all together and then start to divide them in positions? Are you just going to say, 
U10 players go over there, U10 go over there and, and figure it out, uh, something to consider. Uh, the time of each game, the rotation, and really important for me is that you ensure every player gets equal time and a rating. Um, we talked about that a little bit last time where you might have to then invite them back if you don't. I'll leave that up to all of you, but it's just something to consider. The pressure and intensity again. Um, you know, pressure both ways. Pressure in, in the game where they're, it's intense and they're under a lot of pressure. So you try to com create a really competitive environment. Um, but then also, how do they react to the pressure? And we, we see that a lot at, at PDP. Um, some kids do great. They're highly recommended. They come to PDP. And it can just be a little bit overwhelming sometimes for some players. It's a new, new environment. The speed of play is increased. Um, so it, it's something to keep in mind. Quick question, Ian. Um, yeah, uh, after, maybe okay. after this. It'll be perfect sure. timing. Sure, okay. Yeah. So this, I just wanted to um, show you this as an, as an example. Minimize that. So, um, and, and this, again, this is just suggestion, right? But let's say you do have 80 players and you have one field. Um, you know, how many coaches do you have and can you spread them equally uh, so that they can each watch a field? And this is an example. Sometimes we've had to prepare for this many players with, uh, within PDP, actually. So what we would generally do is we would split 40 on one side and 40 on another side. If we could make a top group, and this was the top group on this side that were the oldest players maybe and the players that were returning and so on, and maybe these were the younger players. If, we, if you have a big difference already, you can tell. Maybe that's something you could already organize. But we really wanted to just have these three coaches focus on these 40 players. And they rotate on this side. And as another example, these 40 players, they rotate on this side. And then that way, these three coaches can work together, potentially. Um, and then they can also rotate to ensure that there's a good rotation, the timing of the game, the rest, uh, the substitutes that they're getting in at the right times. Um, if you have goalkeepers and you have you know, enough, you have organize it that way. If you have enough goals, maybe these are small goals, maybe it's line football, maybe this is just possession exercise you want one coach to run. You can obviously see a lot in that, or it's football-y. Um, again, just su suggestions, including keepers you can see. Maybe the director's there. So, and, and I think we all have a tendency to do this. Sometimes we'll come together, the three coaches, and we'll say, hey, guys, come here. What, what do you think about this player? And, and we're watching this field, and we actually turn our back on the rest of the tryout. And I think it's something to always consider. I mean, if these two coaches come together, you can still talk to each other, but maybe this coach, whoops, I tried to move him. That wasn't a good idea. Maybe this coach, um, that's my top coach uh, instinct coming in there. Maybe this coach is standing here and he's facing here and still watching, but the two of them are talking as an example. But just to keep your eyes in case someone gets injured, you want to see it. And I mean, also you're evaluating. So to just keep eyes on, on every field that you can. Um, and then obviously you have a director. Maybe you have someone that's just in charge of, checking the players in, getting their numbers, whatever it might be, and then they're sending them to someone specific who's going to start to organize the rest. So, again, just a suggestion. So, yep. All right, David? Yeah, two questions. One is on the organization, and I think this, this graph um, may, have, may have answered that was about the ideal number of ratio of coaches to players. Hmm. I mean, good question. I... I always like one to 12. Um, I, I think that's one to 15, maybe. More experienced coaches can sometimes take on even more. Um, I mean, if you're, fam if you're already familiar with, you know, 18 of these players or, or 20 of these players, then, you know, really between two coaches, maybe that you could handle 40 players because you're really focused on the other 20 as an example. But um, that's a good question. I, I, I like one to 
one to 12, one to 15 personally. Um, and then, you know, there's some that are capable of taking on a lot more. Okay, great. Uh, another question coming in. Um, uh, I guess in any evaluation, how do you protect against biases that can inhibit a player's chances? It's a great question. Um, I don't know if you can protect against it other than being aware that it, it, it is something that happens that we, we, uh, we sometimes already make decisions before we're watching. Uh, and then we look, we, we look elsewhere. Um, so I think it's really um, trying to look for what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, even of a player that uh, one of your best friends recommended to you, uh, who you trust. Um, I think it's important for you to still get your own opinion. And then, of course, when it comes down to the bias, uh, there's another side of that to where maybe it's a, a dad coaching the team or a family member maybe, I'm not sure, um, or friends of the family and their kids trying out. I, I don't know. I think that's for the leadership of the club to, to be aware of and, uh, and then place the coaches probably in the, in the best spot. Um, you know, you might have – you might have this coach and this coach that just have a real eye for talent. They always have. Um, they've, you know, maybe they've even played at a high level. They've coached at a high level or they've been doing this for a long time, which I know a lot of people on this call. Um, it might be something to consider. You have them at all the tryouts because uh, they're, they don't have a bias. Um, that's the, the key for us with MPDP too, is that we always try to bring coaches from outside the region to work with the regional players so that, um, you know, that we, we make sure we're aware of that. Uh, so that can be really challenging. I think just to educate yourself more on it and, um, and try to make sure you form your own opinions on players. Two more questions on the, the setup. Uh, one sure. is um, how long do you recommend the coach standing in one place? And the other one is would you recommend this orientation for a club tryout? Um, I mean, this is a suggestion. So as far as the club tryout, I mean, I, I'll leave it up to all of you based on how many coaches you have, based on how many players, based on, you know, how many goals you have, availability. Maybe you have another field and maybe one of your fields could actually be, you could play 11 v 11. And on one field, you, you have to divide it up a little bit. And then everyone rotates through the 11 v 11. That would be, you know, even, even better situation. Um, as far as where coaches stand, I think it all comes down to which player, you know, how many players do you have to try to evaluate and identify? Because, you know, if, if these, if there are 10 players in each of these groups and they're, they're moving over each time and th these 10 are moving to this goal, these 10 are, and there's just a rotation around. And then this coach moves over as well. I mean, they're watching a lot of the same players or, you know, did he really get a good evaluation on all 20 players? If he stays here, he can see them double and see a new team coming in as an example. And if this player just stay or this coach just stays focused here, I feel like he could get an even more in-depth um, evaluation of the players here. So, Thank you. Um, yeah, I think if you move too much, it could be a little bit detrimental. But I guess it, it does depend on your role too within it. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, so now if we look at the, the planning piece again, um, so as a preparation and event, and now if we go into the process and the observational tools, um, especially the responsibilities, I think that is a little bit across the board. Um, you know, looking back on, on this, maybe um, I could draw a line in between the staff responsibilities. Um, and the prep, the preparation, obviously, of what we just talked about, but definitely something to consider. A lot of the points I just went over, and really adapting it to your your reality. Um, but this becomes really important if one coach has too much to handle and too much to do, and you're expected to you know to run all of this, and tell them what the rules are, and tell them and another player just showed up late and they come in and which field do they go to? And, and you're trying to run all of this. It, it can be really challenging um, to then have the time to actually sit back and just evaluate. 
Um, so it, it's trying to always keep that in mind and keep that balance. So I think the responsibility piece, um, it's important to take the time to spell that out, to plan ahead and to have meetings ahead of time and, and really plan that out. So now if we go further into the scout forms and the player profile and the rating system, I um, wanted to just show you a few examples again. So for us, as an example with a form, this is what we would use um, at the region, regional level, and even at the state level. So we would already have listed their bib number. We would have their rating. And what we generally do is keep, because we see these players once a month, um, every once in a while, we might see them twice a month if they play in a game, we would keep the rating the same uh, unless we felt that it changed. So when we review each player, we would say, no, they still are, and I'll, I'll go into the ratings in a little bit. Um, but we just keep that rating. We usually use these for, um, for their attendance. Um, you know, maybe they're excused, maybe they're injured. We make a little note. Uh, in the past, we would put a rating in each of these, which there's something to that as well. So if you're having tryouts, you might have it organized like this. You have three dates. After the first one, you give them a rating. Then you do the second one, you see what everyone agrees upon, you have a, another rating maybe and another, and you can see a little bit of, of, uh, of how, they've, how they've done going you know, uh, through, their, through their different tryouts as an example. For us, we'd mark if they're state pool for the regional. Uh, and then these are our boxes, which I'll go more into in the player profile, but then we can make marks uh, for the technical, the tactical, the physical, or the personality. Uh, whether we want to use arrows, uh, we kind of leave it for the coaches to decide. Uh, mainly, we would just want them to be able to comment on each of these, especially if we're not choosing a player. I think it's important that you have some reasoning behind it. Um, and, you know, how long do you really have to, to write? Uh, you're looking down, you're trying to catch the bib number. Uh, the ball goes out of bounds for a moment. You're taking a peek maybe at their date of birth. Maybe you don't even have the clubs listed, which we do a lot uh, when we first get players with big evaluations. We don't even list the clubs for PDP so that they're just focused on the player and that and the, uh, their number. And then uh, obviously the date of birth would be really important. And then we generally have two to th even three positions sometimes listed. And then you can have space for coach notes. Again, this is just an example. Um, you know, for us, we even have uh, just a communication tool where if we, if we know that there are 1.5 rating, we actually highlight this entire, uh, entire row uh, red to say that, uh, that they're not going to be invited back. And then we would put in notes here based on kind of what we observed here. Um, you know, if it's a drop for us, that's because they haven't attended twice and maybe we need to move them to a different group. We need to move them up a group or whatever. So that's an example. Another form that we use um, is uh, what we call a depth chart. Uh, the national teams use these as well. They would have a similar roster and then you fill the roster out and you actually put in their position and the rank per position. So if this was a goalkeeper number one, and this was a goalkeeper number one and number one, you would rank him, he's actually the second keeper, he's the first keeper, he's the third keeper. And then here, they would actually come in to where you could already see like, okay, we rank him first already, or her. Um, here's the second keeper, here's the third. Uh, you know, for those that you have the teams and you're the coach that's returning to the team, or even you're a new coach on the team, you know, this could be really valuable for you to have from the past coach or from last season. And you could say, you know, who was your top nine generally for the whole season? You know, who would you put as your top 11? And then how do these new players fit in that are kind of competing for these positions? But you're always keeping in mind, you know, this player, again, we've talked about it before, like he's a great 10. He can play an 11 as well. Or, you know, she's a, she's a great left center back or left back. Um, but I just wanted to show you that, that that's another uh, example of a, a form to use. Any questions on that one, Robo? <clears throat> no, no questions okay, on that. Okay. 
So important one, and this we could go really in depth and potentially do a whole other course, but I won't put you through all that again, but um, <laughs> uh, it's just how we design the player profile. This is, um, you know, this was mentioned in, um, in Benjamin's game model, obviously. And uh, this is how we divide it so that we have an idea of kind of what we're looking for in the players. And so when we're actually trying to identify talent, when we're trying to um, evaluate them, these are some of the er areas that we use. Um, you know, again, this piece, the ability to handle pressure, I mentioned it before, but sometimes some of the PDP players come and they have good technique and tactically they're good. They're just too nervous or it's a little bit too much for them. Or, you know, the pressure becomes a little bit too much for them to be in that environment. So they're not able to really, you know, read the game well or make good decisions with the ball because they're just, they're just a little bit too nervous. And you might be able to recognize it and you give them another chance or you talk to them and, and then maybe there's still something there. But, um, you know, this is, this is what we have to always consider. And then obviously um, the physical piece as well, which we're going to go into a little bit later. Wanted to give you some other examples because really what what this uh, what this helps with and why I wanted to show you this before we actually got into evaluating players is you can start to use a common language and not just say oh he's good man he's good oh I like him he's good you know okay well what can we be more specific and um, or no he's not at the level you know okay well in what ways and so I think it's important that that you start to uh, come up with your own language. A lot of you, I, I know, already have it. Um, as an example, USSF, you know, these are the key qualities um, all the way to, uh, to the full national team. They use it for all their national teams and they even show this in the grassroots course. So for them, they can go, you know, they go into more depth into reading and understanding the game and what that means to them and that decision making. And taking initiative, being proactive, right? Do they demonstrate focus? Are they always, are they 100%, always giving 100%? They concentrate, execute optimal technical abilities. Obviously, that's the technical, the physical, and this taking responsibility piece. So, you know, can you put some of these in with personality, potentially? You can put some in with tactical, yes. It's, it's kind of up for, it's for everyone to decide how you want to organize that but it really helps to have that common language, I believe, and, uh, and make it really clear about what you're, what you're seeing. Uh, at IAX, for an example, tips is something we use for a long time, technique, insight, the personality and the speed. And when they were scouting, from what we learned, they would, they would flip it and they would go with speed was what they were really looking for, to play at the highest level we're talking about. And the personality piece, if they could you know, handle playing at that level, of course, the insight and of course the technique have to still be there, but they flipped it on what the main areas were they were looking at. And then I wanted to give you an example here of the England FA too. Um, you know, with these, you'll you'll have players that you'll see that might be really strong in one of these areas, um, and and the other areas are average, and you just have to try to weigh it out and decide if 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 there's enough there that you think that they can improve and especially being in your environment, if you can help them to develop and reach their full potential. Um, a good example uh, for us is uh, when I had the honor of coaching with uh, Hugo Perez and Benjamin Zemer, and I was the um, second assistant, um, assistant to the assistant groundskeeper for you Caddyshack uh, fans out there. Um, we had uh, Tyler Adams on the team and we had Jonathan Gonzalez and uh, you know, and that was U16 and you could see with Tyler Adams. I mean, the, he was just, he was a warrior spirit. It was amazing. And his athleticism and his competitiveness and his uh, coachability, his personality. Um, he didn't always make the best decisions reading the game. I mean, Technically, he had some areas to improve, but the personality and the physical piece were so high off the charts that you, he, you wanted him on your team. You wanted him around. Jonathan Jonah was the same way. It was like, you know, he's the, he's the one you want on the team um, because of that. And he had different qualities, but 
It's just to say, you know, is there ever a complete player? Is there ever is, if you look at some of the top players in, in the world, can you find areas where they could improve? Some of them even talk about areas they could improve. So, you know, you have to always try to, to find this balance. Um, I wanted to share this one as well. This is you know, FIFA. Uh, they put out a coaching book, which we shared. Um, David, that's in our um, resources, I believe. We shared that in the NorCal. I, I um, believe with that, I'll double check. And if it's not there, I'll make sure it's the other stuff. No, I'm sure it is. I think okay. it is, yeah. I think and, it is. And I it just pulled, familiar. Yeah, yeah. I pulled this straight out of there. Great. And so, yeah. it, again, it was just their idea when they were talking about talent. These are some of the things they listed. So I just wanted to put it in there. And that's, that's a really uh, resourceful um, or a, a great resource, uh, that document. And uh, there are plenty more in there. But, again, this is, this is for all of you to decide. Then we want to mention a little bit about the rating system. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this could just be uh, – it doesn't have to be 0.5s. It could be just one, two, or three. It could be, you know, I, it's kind of for everyone to decide again. Uh, U.S. Club Soccer with ID2 also uses a rating system. Um, youth national teams also. They're just one to four, actually. And this is what we use for PDP. So I think it's a really good communication tool. Um, and it, it relates a level of player performance at the time. So, you know, maybe um, – Maybe you go see you see a player, and then another coach sees a player, and then you could share with them like, "Oh, I feel that he's a he's a top competitive player that is on track to become a professional." I don't know, and and maybe you have a rating for that. So, this is what we use for our ratings. <clears throat> so, for players to even be in the regional pool at the end of the training or evaluation, they have to have a two, or maybe some players that or some I'm sorry, some coaches are scouts are unsure and they say, yeah, I mean, they're a little inconsistent. They are really lacking a lot of technique. What a great personality. Um, they already have fast twitch muscles. They, you know, and they're still learning the game. I'm not sure. So maybe it's a 1.52 that they have and we would bring them back again. If everyone kind of agrees it's a 1.5, then we say, okay, well right now they're just, they're not at the, the PDP level. Um, and, and so then it, it makes it really clear for everyone. And then you can see, see the rest there. So I thought that would be important to share. <clears throat> so now if we look into the process and obs observational tools, right, and then we start to tie that into the evaluation, which will be our next step, which is what I know all of us really want to do. Um, then there are some other areas that become really important to consider. Okay, the biological age also and the relative age effect. Um, the special trait for me would come out of what we call the T2P2 or those player, that player profile. You know, if you see one of those areas where, man, they, already, they have Olympic, the kid's 15 and already has Olympic speed, maybe. I don't know, whatever it is. A real special trait. Has a nose for the goal, scores goals, whatever. Amazing defender, great goalkeeper. What you see that they already have a natural ability or a feeling for the game, whatever that might be that you think that puts them, that sets them apart. Something to always consider. Their chronological age. Um, maybe they're already playing up. Um, it's something to look at. Um, and that can surprise people sometimes, you know. Um, Maybe they look the same, but they're actually, you got to look at their birth date and really see, are they of that, uh, are they the same age as the, the age group you have? Maybe it's a double age group. And then their environment, what we spoke about earlier, and that could be the personal and club, but it's something we always need to consider. So if we go into the biological age and the relative age effect, um, there, was there were two great webinars from James Bunce, the director of high performance, that I would encourage all of you to look at. Um, I think this link should work. I just took it directly, um, but you'll be able to find it really easy. The second one, he had some technical difficulties, and then I actually had to get on a call, so I, I need to watch more of the second one that he had, but he had two parts. But I took this directly from him. This isn't my language. This is James's language. He has great, he has a lot of experience, really not knowledgeable. Um, 
but this is something that's really, really important for all of us to consider. Um, you know, what is their biological age? That's what I've called it. He's calling it early maturation. So, <clears throat> you know, physically larger at eight years old so that you could see their early maturing that, that quick. And, and with this increased height and weight and muscle mass and being superior in these areas, which are crucial for soccer, these players are going to automatically stand out. Um, it doesn't always mean that they're taller. You know, it might be their weight, but this muscle mass as well. And then these pieces as well, even at really young ages. Um, you'll see that it even, the relative age effect, there's a, there's a reason, I think, for that, because it has a lot to do with the early maturation. And then increased confidence communication, and you can see for the late maturing. And again, I think I showed you a video example in the first webinar. Um, we, we can't now just look past them because we think, oh, well, they're, they're only doing well because uh, of the physical piece. Um, do they have some of the other pieces in the player profile we've mentioned? We certainly don't want to look past them. Uh, we just have to make sure we place them in the right environment so they're challenged. It's, it doesn't do any good for this player to score 1,000 goals when he's 12, 13, 14 years old um, because he's already more advanced than all the other players around him, um, it's actually going to be detrimental to that player in the future. They need to always be challenged. I know it'll help the win column, but we have to think about the player development. What's specific for the player? And then the biological age. So obviously you can see here, and um, you know we, the, the examples that Xavi and Iniesta and Messi and others in the world have shown us, uh, it's you know, it's, it's great to see Rose Lavelle. I mean, it's, um, it's something we always have to keep in mind as well. Again, this is uh, the relative age effect. This is his definition, James's definition, or he, what he had on his presentation. Um, really interesting. He, and, and if you get a chance to watch it, you'll see it. But um, he said in 2018, um, these are uh, these were the births. These were all the people that were born, you know, in 2018 as an example. And he broke, you br they break the year into quarters, and uh, it was pretty even across the board. It wasn't that more kids were born in the first quarter or or second. It was it was pretty even across the board. And then he showed a graph of the men's national team, full national team, and the women's full national team with the graph of their birth dates. And again, it was really close to even. I think the third quarter was just a touch, touch more. Um, but then he showed a graph of the U15 national team. And the first quarter was way above the rest. And his point, which I thought was really valid, was that, you know, even coming from the grassroots and even coming from starting to become competitive players, this is also a bias, so to speak, because they're born earlier in the year. And so imagine a play, you know, someone that's born in, in January and one that's born in December and not only this maturation, but also the confidence, the communication, the personality, the ability for them to, to take on more, more mentally. Um, it, it's something that has to be considered uh, and not just thought of as, well, that means that they're, they're going to be better in the future as well. So it's that performance versus potential. I hope you had an opportunity to look at that. But that's what we're always thinking about with all of this is how is their performance right now versus what do we think their potential could be? And obviously you, you're relating that to your environment. So remember this one, you already have an opinion, right? So then we can start to apply some of that, hopefully. Any questions, David? Sure nope, not no. okay. Oh, the one one just came in, um, right there, Luciano. Um, sure. Okay, I've not screened this yet, so I'm trusting it's good because it just popped Hola, up. Hola, Luciano. I, I, normally, yeah, I read, normally I read them first, but it's Luciano, so I'm sure it's a good one. Let me see. Considering a big part of scouting is recognizing and predicting potential, and what we're able to predict or anticipate only when we've previous experience, what will be your recommendation to help us train our eye? for predicting potential? Mm, good question. 
to train our eye. Um, really, I mean, I think there's a, a personal development piece in there where you, you, could, you could start to think about what, what areas you think you're strong at, at, at identifying. Uh, are there any areas you need to improve? Um, you know, do you have the ability to uh, see a lot of players at the same time? Are you only watching the ball? Um, you know, I, I think that can be really challenging. It, it comes with a lot of experience. That's why, I mean, someone like Luciano and, and some of our other friends here, they, they've been playing and they've played at the highest level and now they're coaching at the highest levels that, um, you know, they already have an eye for talent. I mean, there are a lot of people, if we go watch a professional game, we're really – we're just we're watching and then making our own uh, conclusions about the qualities in those players. I think, like, oh man, I I really like uh, an example Ever Benega. I mean, for me, even when when he was with Valencia, I just thought Ever Benega, man, he just his his passing range, his his grittiness, like. But maybe those were just the qualities that I like to see because that's a position I played, but we would have those conversations. So I just feel like we're all kind of identifying talent all the time in our own, in our own way. Um, now to really apply it to, uh, to a specific event or a tryout or watching games, um, even when you're scouting an opponent, uh, you have to watch and say part of your report should be, well, who were the key players and what were some of their key qualities? Um, so I think it, it comes with experience, but I think also a lot of it comes with, with being really organized beforehand. Um, you know, having a way that you can transfer your ideas at the moment onto paper, maybe if that's what you do, maybe you record it and you watch it again later. Um, you know, maybe you're talking into your phone to record. I mean, whatever it might be to transfer it, um, to train the eye, it, it's really challenging, but um, you know, hopefully some of these some of these suggestions will help a little bit. Thank you. Uh, that's a great segue. Hey, oh man, I don't know why it keeps going. Oh. It's Friday, everyone. <laughs> so this... it's a good segue for this. Yeah. I so we're going to watch this more in the next part. We're just going to watch this for about a minute and a half. How's it looking, Dovey? Is it coming through? It's coming through. I also noticed the stock markets went up a little bit today. So that's good news. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so keep your eye on this. Watch the red team. And we're going to go more in depth. See if there are any players on the red team that catch your eyes. Are our PDP PDP players? We have some that have gone to ICC and ID2 and ID centers for youth youth national teams out here. This was the South versus the North. O6s and some top O7s. When something to consider, I guess. And again, I just want all of you to watch this uh, because we're going to watch it again and even in more depth. And we'll watch more of this, this game because I think you can see their numbers. The camera angle is pretty good. You can see more of the field a lot of times. Okay, so keep that in mind. Bless you, Benjamin. So, uh, <laughs> so planning, the summary. Hopefully this will help a little bit, just to keep in mind, right? Preparation, if you have any pre-information, what, what the event is and how you have it organized, the process, the responsibilities, forms you already have, observational tools, the player profile becomes really important there that you already have a good idea of what your club is looking for. What type of players? Is it position specific? <clears throat> what are those qualities and can you discuss it with other coaches? Or maybe you're on your own and it's just up to you to decide. Well, as Benjamin mentioned, he's still working on his own, own game model. 
as a lot of us are. Uh, so how does it, how does your player profile fit into that? If you're if you have autonomy to just do do what you need to do with your team, um, performance versus potential. Definitely always keep in mind the biological age and the relative age effect. And then I put the, the planning organization just as a reminder that that level of resistance and intensity, it, it, it always has to be considered. Because again, if it's too easy, because the player is biologically two years older than most of the other group, can you find a way to push them up? Can you find a way to challenge them more? Can you put in your top strongest big central defender to play 1v1 against them, whatever it might be, but just keep that in mind. <clears throat> just like a competitive game. So in part three, we'll go in more depth into the evaluation, which thanks for all your patience, we'll finally get there if you feel like still looking at a screen by the end of next week. And then the reporting and selection. Um, we can all improve it. This was from the last one as well. Definitely share your knowledge, experiences about the challenges, constraints. Try to develop as much as you can in your own process. And then for us, the self-development's the same. I always want to leave you with one of the mentors. Same quote as last time. Again, I think that's that, that should be that same, uh, same link <clears throat> that I, I mentioned earlier, or that same... Uh, presentation and thank you everyone appreciate the time a couple of questions or a question came in if anybody else uh, wants to ask any questions we have a few minutes uh, one question in your opinion what effect if any has the birth year versus school calendar year had on soccer um it's something we definitely have to consider i mean i don't know if it what you have to consider is mainly what we're doing for soccer I, I believe in England, and, and some of you can correct me another time, but I believe in England they, they actually go by the school year as well, maybe even for soccer. Um, I thought James mentioned that even in his presentation. So, I mean, I think for us it, it, it could have something to do with their maturity, for sure. So it's something you would have to keep in mind. Um, but mainly for me the relative age effect is um, it's just – it's considering it and keeping in mind that we, we aren't already giving the player, uh, you know, uh, more weight or, or, or uh, we like them a little bit more because they're actually a lot older than the rest of the players that are around. Maybe they are a school year ahead. That might have something to do with it. So maybe they'd seem more mature and you could see it in their personality. Uh, that's, that's certainly possible. So. It's a good one to look up. I, I, I really think it was Ronaldo, the original Ronaldo, the, the best, the phenom, phenomenal. Phen, I always say that one wrong, but you know what I'm talking about, the Brazilian. And I think Pele, and I'm almost sure Diego Maradona, they're all born in, uh, in October, September, right through there. So we don't want to miss any of them. Well, great. Well, thank you, Ian. Um, I'll give you the closing words, um, but we, we appreciate everyone. As always, this has been recorded. Uh, tomorrow you'll get an email with the, the recording, um, and then I'll link to the presentation itself on our website. Um, yeah, okay. I just got a comment there. Um, Germany, the, uh, I think we covered biobanding last week. Could comment. I yeah, biobanding will come up a little bit more in the, yeah. in the reporting. Yep. Oh, the bio banding. Oh, sorry. No, I was, it's benchmarking that we'll speak about a little bit more bio banding. Um, yeah. Bio banding is again, it's just making that decision of where can you place the player best? Um, that'll be something that NorCal would have to consider if their leagues are going, going to allow that they, they have done it in the DA where they allow, um, <clears throat> you know, late matures potentially to to play down an age group so if they're born in 2004 they can play with 2005s as an example um late maturing players so um I, I think there's there's something to that for sure i think belgium's also another country that's big on it um but i i think that's something definitely to consider um but we just have to see what the rules are within the league that you play in obviously
Great. Well, again, this uh, this information will be sent out to everyone tomorrow. Um, stay tuned. Next week we have uh, Monday we have um, uh, Paulo Bonomo um, on on the, the coordination um, specific to soccer, and Wednesday we have Andrew Zimmer on development of a player from a tactical standpoint, and then of course we have Ian rounding this series off uh, a week from today. So, Ian, final words. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for the support. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, I agree what I've heard a few times in the meetings with uh, the NorCal leadership is that it's been really impressive to see how um, positive everyone's remained through all of these these unknowns and, and really come together as a community, as this kind of uh, NorCal family, so to speak. And uh, it's appreciated. Let's keep it going. You know, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, go get some fresh air today. Take care. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.